Job chapter 36, Job 36, and when you found it, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We're actually going to make it through two chapters, but I'm only going to read the first uh, four verses uh, this morning, okay? Job chapter 36, starting in verse 1, and Elihu continued and said, bear with me a little and I'll show you, for I have yet something to say on God's behalf. I will get my knowledge from afar and ascribe righteousness to my maker. For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. This is God's word. You may be seated. Okay, now, uh, if you're new this morning, um, one of the things we've been saying is when we get to Elihu in chapter 32, we've said, hey, this is somebody that we should be taking seriously. He is not more of the same. He's not more of what the three friends have done who had this particular understanding of what suffering was and why people suffered, and, and, uh, and he's cut out of a different cloth, as we're going to see. And, and the reason I think we're supposed to take him seriously and actually see him in the right light is because, is because God's not going to criticize him when he gets to chapter 42 and, and rebukes the three friends, Elihu's not among them. But, but most importantly is that, is that what Elihu does here is he, he, he brings us something new, something we haven't heard. I would suggest this, something that perhaps the ancient world at this point had not yet heard. And what he's going to say is this, con contrary to common knowledge, this sort of understanding in the world at the time, and certainly even in our day, that karma isn't what, how things operate. And that is that, that it is not suffering. Suffering is not caused by sin all the time. It can be, but the friends thought that's how it always is. If you suffered, it's because you sinned. Well, he comes along and says, no, it's not that Job's sin is the cause of his suffering, but he says, Job's suffering may be the cause of his sin. And I hope everybody can say, you, you know this, right? If, if you're a Christian, you know that when you suffer, it is very often the cause of your sin. You start thinking things about God that are not right. You might say things about God that are not right. You behave out of alignment with you, which you know to be true because of your suffering. That's new. That's an important insight. But today, he's going to tell us something else. He's going to say essentially that God may actually take that suffering and use it not to demonstrate his anger, but to show his love. He's being loving in what he's doing. That God may not use this as punishment for sin as much as a refinement in your righteousness if you're a follower of Jesus. He's going to say essentially that God doesn't use this as preparation for destruction, but protection from it, so that God has a purpose in suffering. Now, in what, what he's going to do, he's going to, all of this is going to come under this umbrella of only God, only the God that we say we believe in could do this. There is no other being in the universe that can do the kinds of things that, that, that Elihu is going to say God does, and because of that, we can trust him. And because of that, we need to, to listen to him. Okay, so Elihu is saying, Job, I, I want to reintroduce you, if you will, to that God. I want you to know this God that, that I'm going to extol here. So we start off, and I want to show you really four things this morning. The first is, see the prophet of God. That's in verses one through four. Now, I've said before, I think Elihu stands in as a prophet. And here, let me show you why. Look at verse two. He says, bear with me a little while, and I'll show you, for I've yet something to say on God's behalf. So now I'm making the claim that this is coming from God. I will, I will get my knowledge. I'm not making this stuff on my own. I'm ascribing this to my maker. This is coming to you, Job, coming into the world through God, through this prophetic word, okay? Then he says something really crazy to our ears, for truly my words are not false, verse four, one who is perfect in knowledge is among you. <laughs> now that sounds incredibly arrogant to us. And I've told you before, be careful. It's hard for our modern ears to know exactly how that would have been understood. But what we do know, even from the book of Job, is that when we see words like perfect being described to somebody, uh, it doesn't mean sinless perfection, okay? God calls Job upright, same idea, that he's, he's a good and righteous and upright, blameless, in fact, he calls him. 
So is Job just sinlessly perfect? We'll look at that in a moment. But I think that's what's happening here. I don't think what, what Elihu is doing is claiming I'm perfect in knowledge, therefore I'm omniscient, I, have, I, I know everything. What I think he's saying is because my maker has given me this word, I have something perfect to share with you, right? This is how prophets would have understood. I must say, thus says the Lord, and if this is coming from God, it's perfect, okay? That's the idea. That I'm not claiming that for my own. I'm not claiming to be a genius. I'm speaking for God. And I want to tell you something. I want, I want you to hear this new insight that thus far has never been said. Okay? So that's the prophet of God. And the second part I want you to see as we walk through this is the purpose of suffering for the righteous sinner. Okay? Now take particular. There is a purpose in suffering for the righteous sinner. I'm going to show you this kind of in each part of this, okay? In other words, what he's going to say is God is never arbitrary. God is not mean-hearted. God has a purpose for every single movement, everything he does, and what he's doing is always good. You understand this? If you're a follower of Jesus, there has never been a moment of your existence that God is not being good to you regardless of what you're going through. This is how the Bible's gonna talk. That God is always, only being good to you. It's hard for us to see, I get that. But that's how the Bible's going to talk. So now keep going. Let's go to verse five of chapter 36. Look with me. He says, behold, God is mighty and does not despise any. Okay, God is not disdainful towards his creation. Okay, God's not doing that. He's mighty in strength of understanding. Job, Job, what I need you to know is that God doesn't, God's not a tyrant. He doesn't just like, you know, like to just torture people for play. He's not, he's not toying with people. That's not how God is. He's not being disdainful towards his creature. Rather, look at verse six. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their right. Verse seven, he does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but with kings on the throne, he sets them forever and they are exalted. Now, if you've been paying really close attention, you're probably like, wait a second, Chris. This sounds, verses six and seven sound an awful lot like Job's friends. Right, Job's friends would have said, God punishes the wicked, God rewards the righteous, right? That's how they would have talked. I want to suggest that's not what's happening here, and I'm not trying to just give Elihu a free pass. I'm going to explain to you, I want to show you, and hopefully uh, convince you that, that in fact, uh, that's not how Elihu is talking here. <laughs> what I think Elihu is doing is giving a general principle, in general, there is a reward for the righteous. There is punishment for the wicked. Like, let me say it this way. If you read the Proverbs, okay? Read the Proverbs sometime and you're gonna read things about God does this for the righteous. God does that for the wicked. You heard David say things like, like I've, I'm, I'm young, but now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. Does that mean a righteous person, somebody following Jesus, will never have hardship, will never live in poverty, will always be able to feed themselves and will never have to beg? No. I could go to Calcutta, India, and we, we could look at people who say, man, I'm following Jesus, and I'm living hand to mouth. I'm having a hard time feeding myself. I'm begging for bread. I think he's saying, here's a general principle. In general, this is how this world is going to work. And, and by the way, eternally, that's exactly how it's going to work. Remember, one of the things we said we had to do during this whole series was take a look back and say, look, um, we have to have a, a longer time horizon than just our lives in order to see these things play out. So in the long run, here's what we can say. God will punish the wicked. God will reward the righteous. The problem is the short term, isn't it? This is what vexes Job. This is what vexes you and me. This is why lots of people turn and say, I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. Because they look at the short term of suffering and think, wait a minute, this is not fair. How can this be? Why do the righteous suffer? Right? This is his problem. Now, his friends, how do the, if you were to ask his friends, if you've been here and you've been listening carefully, and you were to say to them, why do the righteous suffer? They would have said, they don't, ever. The righteous never suffer. The righteous are only rewarded. And if you're suffering, then it is proof positive that you're wicked. This is a problem for Job. Because what we've been told is, no, Job is, 
is blameless, he's upright, he's righteous, he, he turns from evil, he fears God. Right? That's what we know about him. And so how does this work, guys? Like there's, there's got to be something else. Job is righteous. Now, to say Job is blameless and upright, remember this, does that mean he was sinlessly perfect? No. No, we, we know we know that Job sins. We know, in fact, later on, he's going to repent in dust and ashes. Chapter 42, verse six. I repent and, I mean, I am, I am coming in sort of this, this abject sense of submission before God and say, I have sinned. So how is this? See, see I think what, 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 what he's, he's looking at is saying there, there is a possibility, there is a possibility that you can be righteous and a sinner at the same time. Okay, that, that's you and me, Christian. If I'm reading my Bible right, I understand that I'm a sinner. Everybody gets that one, right? That's the easy one. I, I just have to get up in the morning and kind of hear the thoughts that go in my head and some of my behavior and things that come out of my mouth and I realize, no, I'm a sinner. Well, the, the harder one is to go, but I'm righteous, right? And yet this is how the Bible's gonna talk about me. It's going to say you're, you're righteous and you're a sinner, okay? So Job, this righteous one, will end by repenting in dust and ashes and God will treat him as righteous. Uh, the reformers, Martin Luther, actually came up with this Latin phrase. Maybe you've heard this, simul justus et peccator. That's a mouthful, so let's just pull it apart. Simul justus et peccator. Simul is what you might Start, sounds familiar, simultaneous, okay, at the same time. Justice means, it sounds like justice, it actually means righteous, okay. Et, remember your history class, et tu, Brute, um, and, and you, Brutus, also, Brutus, right? So, so, so simul, simultaneous, at the same time, justice, righteous, et, and peccator, sinner. Okay, put it all together, that what the Bible says, and I think Martin Luther is exactly right, is that we are simultaneously, at the same time, we are both righteous and we are sinners, okay? This is what I think Elihu is doing. There are righteous people, there are sinful people. There's these two categories, right? But it is possible for them to come together and say there are righteous sinners, okay? So, so let's, let's keep that in mind. Now, why don't I think that he's like his friends in verses six and seven? Why do I think it's different? Well, mostly because of what follows. Look at verses eight through 10. And look at how he says. He says, if they who, the righteous, are bound in chains, wait, How's that? And caught in the cords of affliction. And then he, God, declares to them their work and their transgressions that they, the righteous, are behaving arrogantly. Look at verse 10. He opens their ears to instruction and commands that they return from iniquity. They, the righteous, they suffer. How different that is from the friends. The friends said, no, no, no. Righteous people don't suffer ever right? They, they only have good happen to them. So here he's got a, a righteous person who's suffering. They're not sinlessly perfect, according to verse 7, okay? They're still indwelling sin. There's still pride. There's still arrogance. They're still falling short in many ways of what God's standard is. They still need to repent. In fact, so when Job repents in chapter 42, verse 6, I repent in dust and ashes. God doesn't say, oh, no, no, no need, Job. No, you're good. God receives it. You're exactly right. You needed to repent. You thought and said some things about me, Job, where that is a righteous repentance and you needed to go through that. You need to get to this place where you say, I repent. I mean, Martin Luther, again, said when he nailed his theses to the Wittenberg door, the first one was when our Lord and Master commands to repent, he meant that all of the Christian life be one of repentance. We actually repent, like I've, I've sinned. Like we should be doing this all the time. I'm righteous, but I'm a sinner. See, let me just say it again. The prosperity gospel's garbage. It's garbage. Okay, why? 
Because the, the prosperity is going to be if you're righteous enough, if you have enough faith, right, you're not going to suffer and be healthy and wealthy and all's going to go well. That's garbage. That's a bill of goods. That doesn't happen in this life, right? There's a lot of suffering. Righteous people suffer. Righteous people are poor. Righteous people can be afflicted. So what Elihu does that's so revolutionary is he opens up the possibility that had never been thought of before that Job, hey, wait a minute, you might in fact be righteous, but you're still a sinner. There's still indwelling sin. And what God does is he's gonna open your ears, Job. See that in verse 10? I'm gonna open your ears. The Bible talks about this. God, Psalm 40, David says, you opened my ears. Right, there, there's this, he's gonna give you the ability to hear what he wants you to hear in the midst of your suffering. David's gonna say this in Psalm 119, it was good that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. Affliction taught me something. The, the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. Even Jesus, right? Now, he didn't sin. Job sinned in the process. Jesus' sin didn't cause him to suffer, but he had to, he had to learn obedience. And this is how we learn. Suffering is one of those things that uncovers dimensions of godliness and Christian maturity. We could say a lot of things that we would never know without suffering. This is, hear me, this is the theological shot heard around the world. Nobody, if you're like me, then you believe that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. I don't mean it describes the oldest time, like Genesis describes the oldest time. I'm saying literally it was written before any other book. Then, then this is something that maybe had never been brought into the world like this. That there is in fact this righteous suffering. There's this righteous sinner and they may suffer. To say something to this effect, that suffering for righteous, for, for, for righteous sinners is not the fire of punishment. It's the forgery for purity. It is not a fire of God's punishment on your life. It is a forge where the, the silver and the gold go in and the dross is melted away and it comes out purer than it went in before. That's the idea. Job, maybe God is doing something bigger than you can see right now, okay? He's opened your ears and you're gonna hear what he has to say. Now, keep going and look at verse 11. He says, if they listen, okay, God, God has opened their ears, he commands something. If they listen and serve him, they complete their days in prosperity and their years in pleasantness. But if they do not listen, they perish by the sword and they die without knowledge. It's really, he's just asking two questions. How do you respond to the hand of God allowing you to go su through suffering in your life as a righteous person, Okay. You, you, what will we do? What will you do with suffering? Say, there's the, there's the listening and blessing and there's not listening and curses, okay? One of the things we're learning is that suffering causes things to come up when you realize, you realize what's really going on in your heart. It reveals something about you, doesn't it? It sort of shakes the foundation of your faith and like, what's this built on? What is this built on? Is it on firm foundation or is it shaky? Okay, so, so how am I going to respond? Am I going to listen to the voice of rebuke of God in my life or will I not listen? Now, so, so, so then he says, look, there's, there's now these two responses. Listen or not listen. Another way of saying it, look at verse 13 and 14. The godless in heart cherish anger. They do not cry for help when he binds them. They die in youth and their life ends among the cult prostitutes. Now, let's talk about this for a second. I think he's saying, number one, there's the reaction, I don't listen. That's the godless in heart. And what do godless in heart do with suffering? Uh, they get mad. I, 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 may have, I may have sort of this, this godly exterior, but on the inside, it's not really real. And so I get mad. I don't cry out to God because I've sort of rejected him. I don't want his help anymore. I'm not sure I believe in God. And look what he says in verse 14. They die in their youth and their life ends among the cult prostitutes. Now, again, I think what he's using here is hyperbole, right? You understand he's exaggerating to make a point. And the exaggeration is they're gonna die young and, and they're gonna become, I don't know, 
cult prostitutes. Well, that seems extreme, right? That seems really extreme. I think what he's doing is he's, he's setting up this, this hyperbolic, this exaggeration to say what ends up happening is this downward spiral. And let me say this. Hebrews 6 is gonna talk about people who have sort of tasted of the things of God and walk away. I don't think it's talking about people that are saved. I think it's talking about people who sort of, they come in, like, let me, let, me, let, me, let me test these Christianity waters. Let me come in and, you know, feels like my life is messed up or whatever, and I kind of want a better life than I've got right now, and maybe I'll try Christianity. Maybe the prosperity gospel will appeal to me or whatever, right? And they get in, and they, and they find out, you know, that, that debt doesn't work. It do, life doesn't work that way, so I'm out. This thing doesn't work. L- listen, some of you know, some of you can think of faces and names of people that you know that at one point would have professed to be Christians and have walked away, and very often, people who dabble in that and then walk away from it, abandon it with, I mean, just, just I, I, I eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow we die. So, so I think it's what he's saying. They go through the spiral of like, man, I, I'm now... I'm now walking away. The, the, the you know, old, old English way of saying it talked about dissipation. I'm now going to enter a life of dissipation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to so walk away from God that can end sometimes in sexual morality. That can end sometime, sometimes inside of a bottle. That can end sometimes inside of you know, addiction. It can, end, it can end in divorce. It can do all kinds of things to people who say, I'm done with God. I'm done with, I don't want no more of this, right? This is one of the dangers, Right? So he says, these, there's this, that's one response. Get angry, reject God's help, but, but there's a, a, another response. Look at verse uh, 15. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction and he opens their ear by adversity, right? So here's the other one. God may open your ears, there it is again, of the afflicted of the righteous and give you the ability to hear and therefore heed the rebuke, the kind of thing that he's trying to reveal to you about your life so that you'll turn from your sin. You see that? Look at verse 15. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction and he opens their ear by adversity. There's David again, right? If it was good that I was afflicted, that I might learn your law. You were teaching me something, right? So listen, he's saying, okay, so if that's the case, he reveals this through affliction, then when God reveals that in your heart because of your suffering, then you repent. You say, God, I I, I come before you, I'm seeing things in my heart and you're revealing, you're opening my ear and I repent before you for what I've done. So, So I think what he's saying is, Job, what you feel as a dagger in your back and God twisting the knife, that's not it. It's a scalpel in the hand of a skilled surgeon cutting away cancer, Job. That's what God's doing. He's he's getting into the indwelling sin. He's getting into these places of your heart and saying, I'm gonna get these out of here. If you'll listen to me, if you'll listen, listen to me, Christian. You can and should study your Bible. You can and should come to church and listen to the Bible preached to you. You can and should memorize scripture and meditate upon it. All of those are wonderful. We're going through a series, you know, over the year, many of you are going through the the spiritual disciplines with us, right? And and those are all really good. But hear me, uh, there are some things that you will never know in the Christian life apart from affliction, apart from suffering. You just won't. There'll be places of growth that will never happen. Do you understand this? For the Christian, suffering in the hands of God is a master class. It's a master class. I'm gonna show you things and teach you things you weren't even aware of. Look, let me, let me give you an example. Let's suppose, any of you ever done a fast of any kind? Just can I see your hands? Okay, so a lot of you, okay, good, yeah. Some of you involuntarily because of surgery, I'm not talking about that. Talking about like you actually like, nope, I'm gonna deny myself food or whatever it is for these few days. Um, you probably noticed something. If you, did an, if you did it for more than like a day or two or three or four, you probably were like, um, I don't like this and I feel testy and I feel angry and I feel impatient and all this. See, now here's what we tend to do. We tend to go, <laughs> by the way, fasting is voluntary affliction. It's voluntary suffering. 
And what is being revealed? Is it that I shouldn't fast because fasting makes me impatient and suffer? It makes me, you know, on edge and angry. No, it, it, it doesn't make you that. It's just revealing what's there, right? It's just showing you what's already in your heart. Like um, uh, Michelle and I used to say to each other, we didn't know we were angry until we had children. Can I get a witness, right? <laughs> Parenting is voluntary affliction. Okay, it's lovely, it's wonderful. There's so much that God gives to us, but it is affliction. And there are things, like I've told people, like for most people, I think your sanctification has like these three main stages. The time you're in your home, God is doing a work amongst your parents and your family, right? Then you move in and you become married. That's the second part of your sanctification. You're now, you're now having the rough edges shaved off by somebody you didn't grow up with and didn't know and your you're opposites, right? And then you move into the parenting phase, right? And what happens there? even more sanctification where you're recognizing things about yourself that weren't there before. This is affliction. This is what it does. It, it, the, the question is whether or not we're, we're listening, right? Whether or not we're attuned to that and saying, okay, God, you're showing me some things about my heart. You're showing me places of indwelling sin because you want to deal with those. You, you actually want to get in like a surgeon, root those things out. In fact, look at, keep going and look at verse 16. He also allured you out of distress into a broad place where there was no cramping and what was set on your table was full of fatness. That's a good thing, by the way. That's not cholesterol inducing. That's, that's fatness in the Old Testament was a sign of blessing, right? So what's he saying? He's saying, you know what God was doing to you? Job, do you not recognize? What you must recognize is the exceeding loving kindness of God to bring you to this place that you're in because whether you see it or not, there is a table of God's blessing and the fatness of God spread before you that he wants to teach you. You will come out on the other side of this, Lord willing, full of God. He draws you out into that, right? It's beautiful. It's amazing that, that, that he's talking like this, right? This is, this is so different than the friends. But he says, look now, here's the problem, Job. Verse 17, you're full of the judgment on the wicked. Judgment and justice sees you, okay? You, you're feeling this, but I think what he's saying there, full of the judgment on the wicked. I don't think he's saying that your life, you are being judged by God. He's saying things that the, the judgment of the wicked is saying, man, you're turning this back around and you're, you're judging God if you were if you will. You're, 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 you're scoffing at him. In fact, keep going. He says, he says, beware lest wrath entice you into scoffing and let not the greatness of the ransom turn your side. So it's, it's very, like one of the warnings we need to hear as Christians is when we go through suffering, it can become scoffing of God. That's where Job has sinned. Let not the greatness of the ransom turn you aside, Lord. He's saying, he's saying, he's saying Job, don't let the costliness of repentance when God's revealing this to you, submit, follow him, listen to him, repent of it, right? He says, will your cry for help avail to keep you from distress or all the force of your strength, right? You, 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 you do, do, do not long for the night when people vanish in their place. Take care and do not turn to iniquity for this you have chosen rather than affliction. Okay, this is, be careful, Job. Be very careful. You're on a slippery slope here. Don't become a, coffer, a scoffer, right? Don't, don't let your repentance deter you. Listen to what God has to say. In fact, he goes on, look at verse 22. He says, behold, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed for him his way? Who can say you have done wrong? Okay, what's the answer so far? Who's like him? No one. Who can teach God? No one. Who can prescribe? Who can actually put guardrails around God and say, God, you gotta stay in here. I wanna box you in. You can't do that. Who can say you've done wrong? No one. Remember, Job, verse 24, to extol his work of which men have sung. Job, the only proper response here is that you would worship God. You would sing to God. You would exult in him in the midst of your suffering. Job started that way, right? I, 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 I don't know what's happening, but the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job didn't sin with his mouth. Okay, so this is, this is the purpose of God for the righteous sinner, but let's keep going, and I want you to see the providence of God in a fallen world. Now, here's what's gonna happen starting in verse 25. 
uh, of, of, chapter, of chapter 36. Um, uh, he, he's going to switch tactics here, okay? And so what he's done, remember, what he's done for, for, uh, for chapter 36 so far is to say, look, look, there, there's, there's, there's suffering that comes into our world and God has a purpose for that. It comes to even righteous people and he's, he's being kind and he's loving you and he's showing you some things and he's trying to root this out. He's not trying to destroy you, Job. He's loving you and he's, he's setting a table for you. Will you eat of it, okay? Now he's gonna switch and he's gonna say, look, God knows what he's doing. Let me prove to you God knows what he's doing. He's gonna take us up to a universal scale and he's gonna start talking to Job in ways that, that God is gonna talk to Job starting next week. He's gonna say, look, look, God is always doing more Christian, good for us to remember, he is always doing more than your experience of God in your world. It is really easy and tempting for us to believe, I understand God because I see him in my sphere and this is how, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about theology, I'm talking about your experience of God is the limits of what God can do, what God can't do. And he's going to say, let me show you, let me, let me scope out Job here for a second and talk about this unbelievably, meticulously sovereign God that we serve, okay? So start reading. He says, verse 25, all mankind has looked on it. Man beholds it from afar. Behold, verse 20, 26, God is great and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. Okay, so we, have, we serve an eternal God and he, is, he doesn't mean we can't know anything about God. It means we cannot have a, a exhaustive knowledge of God. God is incomparable. God in that way is unknowable. I can't capture all of him. Uh, we've talked about God being like an iceberg, right? The, the, the nine-tenths of it are under the surface. The one-tenth is above, and I'll, I'll never really know what's under the surface there, right? There's always more of God, but, but, but keep going. So he's, he's gonna say now, he's gonna say, watch how sovereign God is, and he's gonna use the processes of nature to talk about God. So, so look at this, look, go to verse 27. He says, for he draws up the drops of water, they distill his mist in rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. What's he, he's describing evaporation and precipitation, right? It's amazing, his, this ancient, you know, uh, Near Eastern uh, man is looking and saying, I've been able to observe this. There's this evaporation and there's this precipitation and God pours out rain abundantly, this is a good thing, on on people, on his creation. He's caring for them, okay? So, so, so this is the first part of that. But then look where he goes. He, 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 keeps, he keeps talking and he says for, uh, uh, in verse 29 and says, can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thunderings of his pavilion? Behold, he scatters his lightning about him and covers the roots of the sea. Now he's gonna move to thunder and to lightning, right? We had these maybe gentle rain or nice big rains and now it turns into thunder and lightning for by these he judges people and he gives food in abundance. See these two things? Thunder, lightning can be judgment on some, can be abundant for others. He covers his hand with the lightning and commands it to strike the mark. That's not Zeus that's doing that, right? Zeus was the lightning bolt holder. This is God. And do you see what he said? And he commands it to strike the mark. God's lightning is laser guided. That's not how you experience it, is it? Seems like these random little, you know, veins in the sky that come down. It's saying every lightning bolt that touches the earth is God's doing. It's crashing. Look at this. Declares his presence. Do you know that? Do you know that when God sends a lightning bolt, do you know when thunder rumbles through the sky, this is God saying, I'm here. I'm declaring my presence. I want to be known. See, see we, we see things through a very different lens, Christian, right? We, we see the natural process of the world and see God, God. God, I remember when our kids were really little and we lived in the Midwest. Have you ever hear, heard of Midwest um, or Texas thunder and lightning storm? It's crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's shattering and, and it'll make your teeth rattle, right? And it's that one of those, one of those moments 
and our kids, you know, of course, you're, you're frightening. You hear these big strike and, 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 and you wait for it and, and then you hear, the, you hear the thunder. And we used to remember we'd say to our kids, hey, you know, like, 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 what's God doing right now? What's he saying? You know, I used to say things like, he's saying, I'm, I'm mighty or I love you. Right? There's, there's two different ways we can process this. Look at verse, chapter 37. At this also my heart trembles and leaps out of his place. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets it go and is lightning to the corners of the earth. After it his voice roars. Do you see, the, see what just happened? Chapter, verse three, he says he lets the lightning go and then we wait, don't we? One, two, three, Boom! That's verse four. His voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. Isn't that amazing? So here's Ellie who's saying, God is in charge of all of this, not Zeus, not Thor, right? He, 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 he holds lightning in his hand, but he doesn't just hold, he shoots, he doesn't just shoot, he aims, and he doesn't just aim, he hits the bullseye every single time. That's God. Every lightning strike, every thunderstorm is the announcement of the presence of God. What a way to view lightning storms. And for some, it will create terror, but if you're listening, Christian, it'll produce worship. Like, God, you are mighty. You're doing this, right? Now keep going, because look, look what he says in, in, in verse, uh, 30, or, or, verse 6 of, of chapter 37. He says, for to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise, to the downpour, his mighty downpour, he seals up the hand of every man that all men may, whom he made may know it. Then the beasts go into their lairs and remain in their dens. From its chamber comes the whirlwind, cold from scattering winds. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen fast. Now, what's he saying there? Did you catch that? He says, he says the snow and ice come, and when they come, beasts go into their den. Men and women are sealed up. Isn't that exactly right? Like this, the, these weather elements cause us to react in certain ways. Tony Reinke, I love this. Listen to how he, he's talking about this passage and he says this, by inclement weather, God seals the hand of every man with his storms. He zip ties our hands and places us under house arrest or as the NIV, NIV says, he stops all people from their labor. Blizzards and monsoons shut people inside their homes and beasts inside their caves. So God commands dumps of snow and torrents of rain. Why? Because he's positioning and repositioning each of his creatures on a chessboard. In all four seasons, God uses his creation to guide the work of man. Major weather disruptions are one of God's means to guide his creatures to where he wants them. Delayed flights, canceled meetings, viruses. If God chose to keep us all shut inside in 2020, it was no hard thing for him to pull off. God governs the business of his creatures through his created order and very often through weather patterns. He governs our travels through snow, ice, lightning, storms, power outages, flooding, you name it, all the seasons are including here. Isn't that awesome? This is God saying, I do all these things and I have a purpose behind him. There's none of this. And if I have a purpose for this and I have a purpose for your suffering, Job, and I have a purpose for your suffering, Foothill, and I know what I'm doing and I'm, I'm coordinating all these things all at once. I'm doing far more than you can imagine. Why, God? What are you doing? Go down to, to chapter 37 and verse 12. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands on them on the face of the habitable world, whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. Listen, don't miss this. God, through all of these things that he's doing in, in creation, is commanding and guiding people. He's correcting and he's loving. The same storm that dumps down on the mountains and leaks into the aquifers and feeds rivers and streams and allows crops to be watered and people to be blessed is the same storm that killed the Donner Party. What are you doing, God? I don't know. I, I that's not God answering, that's me. How do we explain this? I can't, he's God. I, 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 don't, I don't know the trillion things he's doing all at once. I can't, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who could be his counselor? 
who's given a gift that he could be repaid. And so look what he does. He turns now, verse 14 of, of, of chapter 37. Hear this, O Job. Stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Okay, Job, let's turn it back to you and to your suffering. I don't understand. I don't think Elihu is saying, let me explain to you how God works. I think he's saying, this is the God we serve. And Job, what you must reconcile is God is doing a trillion things all at once and, and you don't have the knowledge to keep up with him. You can't possibly know all his ways, Job. So, so for example, he says he's gonna turn and now he's gonna talk to him a little bit like God's gonna talk to Job starting next week. Look at verse 15, he says, do you know how God lays his command upon them, that is upon the rains and the, 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 the clouds and causes the lightning of his cloud to shine? Do you, Job? What's the answer? No, I have no idea how he does that. Do you know the balancings of the cloud, the wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge, you whose garments are hot when the sun is still because of the south wind? No, I don't. Can you, like him, spread out the skies, hard as cast metal, mirror? I, I can't. Then, Job, what, what do you have? You, you think you're, you keep arguing. I want to go before God. I'm going to present my case. I want him to hear me. And then if I just could, then God would have to hear the justice of my cause and he would put this to an end. I want to plead before God. And he says, look, teach us what we shall say to him. Verse 19, we cannot draw up our case because of darkness. We're in darkness. Shall it be told him that I would speak? Hey, God, hey, God, there's, there's somebody really smart who wants to come into your presence. Did a man ever wish that he would be swallowed up? You know what he's saying? You do that, Job, you'll be swallowed up by the might and majesty of God. Job, Job, his ways are beyond understanding. So there's only thing, one thing left to do. You've seen the purpose of God for the righteous sinner, the providence of God in a fallen world, but I want you to see this last thing, the worship of God as the proper response. Go to verse, verse uh, chapter 37, verse 21. And now, no one, and now no one looks on the light when it is bright in the skies, when the wind has passed and cleared them. Out of the north comes golden splendor. God is clothed with awesome majesty. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is great in power, justice, and abundant righteousness. He will not violate. So here's the scene. The storm clouds are starting to part. All that lightning and rain and thunder. And when it parts, out walks God blazing in light, in approachable light. Out of the north, by the way, this is where they understood the gods came out of the north. Right? This is where Zeus, this is where the pantheon of gods, and here he's saying, no, no, they don't come. Here comes God riding on a cloud, right? It's that idea of here he comes and we cannot find him. He's great in power, justice and abundant righteousness. So listen, he ends this way. Therefore, men fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. You think you know better than God? You, you think you can approach him this way? Job, you can't. This is God. He's showing up on the scene now. Listen, church, we serve. This is what I love about this whole passage. We serve a God of the mundane and the majestic. We serve God of the great epic moments in history and these daily weather patterns. Like, what's going to happen? I'm going to give Glendora, you know, clouds until this time of day, and then the sun will come through because I've commanded it to be that way for you. This is what I've ordained. He feeds birds, and he, he cares for lilies, and he watches sparrows, and he aims lightning, and he determines every die cast in Vegas and there is not a random arrow that's shot from a warrior, according to 1 Kings 22. God knows the trajectory of all. There's nothing random. There's nothing by chance. He rules over all. Worship him. Now, we're ready to meet God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your, your word. Thank you for reminding us, God, helping us to understand that, Lord, there, that, 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 that suffering is very often a part of the master class that you're trying to teach us. And God, it's hard. There, there's people here today that are confused, disoriented, 
in the fog of war trying to understand and, and Lord, they don't. God, I pray that what they would hear, if nothing else, is there is a God who knows and there is a God who loves you and there is a God who perhaps through this will begin to point things out about your own heart because he's alluring you out to a wide place with a table full of fatness. Oh God, may we see it. May we know it. May we taste of it and taste and see that the Lord is good. God, help us. Help us in the midst of that. And God, then help us to just worship you. You are glorious and great and mighty and majestic. You oversee worlds and universes. And God, you oversee my tiny little life. And if you can do the bigger, surely you can do the smaller. If you can decide when rain clouds form and when they drop their payload, and you can do that all over the world, deciding when and where and for what purpose. If you can point every strike of lightning to hit its target exactly the way you want it. And God, surely, surely you are a God who can care for me. If you care for lilies and sparrows, then God, you'll care for those you love so much more than that. Remind us of that today, oh God. We love you, we praise you, we thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name.